Hi everyone, uh, this presentation is some kind of like real life field experience that we've had uh, working for SUSE, uh, essentially dealing with remote worker nodes, which in our terms mean don't have a close connectivity or a dedicated master node uh, with it. So it's not a single cluster, they are remote, they could be 100 miles apart from their master. So. First of all, I'm going to introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Daniel Sheldon. Uh, I'm a consulting engineer at SUSE. Uh, I've been here for about eight months now, but I have about five or six years-ish uh, experience with Kubernetes on and off. Uh, and I'm going to allow Juan to introduce himself. Well, I'm, I'm Juan Herrera. We work together in the consulting team. Well, I've been at SUSE Likes this year doing mostly open stack and Kubernetes stuff. Thank you. So looks like a really small agenda, but there is lots and lots of content in here. Uh, hopefully we're going to have time for questions at the end. Uh, we're essentially going to share some of the challenges we've seen in the field, as I've already mentioned, specifically around two customers or projects doing quite different things, but with the same idea or concept in mind. So that's what we're going to do to begin with. We're going to review the uses of Kubernetes in a non-canonical way, which is essentially the, the proposals of these two projects. And we're going to go through the lessons learned and uh, the discussions that we had with each of these uh, customers. So the two different projects, one is a large telco company, uh, lots of 5G antennas, uh, I believe there's over a thousand and one uh, electronics company that do uh, intelligence-based surveillance, so with cameras. And each one of these, albeit very different, so all the antennas are remote, all the surveillance cameras, again, remote. So re work, remote worker nodes rather than clusters, so they could be anywhere. And we'll go through some of the problems that that introduces in the Kubernetes landscape and our best practices and the, you know, the discussions that we've had around them. So the projects both have common denominators. Uh, they don't want the remote locations to run full Kubernetes clusters, mainly based on resource usage and you know, the, the, the resources that they have available. They felt that they wouldn't be able to run full cl clusters based on the, uh, the extra usage. Uh, they both see the value in Kubernetes but the use cases that they provided to us are not exactly uh, standard. So that's what we're going to, going to talk about. Uh, so yeah, as I've mentioned, they all have remote worker nodes or want remote worker nodes. Same common architectural requirements uh, with, with the same challenges. And the, these challenges are listed here. So challenges with scheduling the workloads, how do we schedule those? pods or applications onto these remote worker nodes, especially in uh, instances where, you know, the master node can't communicate to the worker node, the latency between them. So challenges with the controller and keeping the cluster healthy was also an issue. Again, if we lost connection for five minutes, or I can't remember off memory, but it will come up what the uh, default timeout is, then that node, we can't schedule it, uh, which brings in challenges for high availability as well. Uh, latency I've already mentioned, so another problem they had because they were stretch clusters and all of these worker nodes also saw the same overlay network when, uh, for example, a ping hit a 5G antenna, it may not go to that worker node in that physical location. So then there'd be latency going from that node, from that antenna, sorry, to a node that could be 200 miles away, for example. and Applications deployment kind of ties into the scheduling, but how do we manage those deployments to those uh, remote worker nodes as well? So uh, our best practice for remote locations or remote edge locations is to deploy a Kubernetes cluster, a full Kubernetes cluster at every single site. And you might think all about all the resource usage. Uh, which we will get to in the next slide. So having a full Kubernetes cluster means that not only do we uh, wipe out some of the 
contentions and the problems that we'd have with remote worker nodes. Uh, we also it also means we don't have to tweak any of the the default configs for timeouts and things like that to get the clusters to work and not be constantly in an unhealthy state. Um, so Rancher, in this instance, can provide all of the tools needed. Uh, the only drawback being the slight increase in consumption on the remote sites because of the, the master nodes, which later on we will talk about. And there's a way that we can deploy these sites at scale, and that is with something called Fleet. So the best practice can only really be implemented in this scenario with a powerful continuous delivery approach. So Fleet is capable of that and can perfectly fit within the custom scenarios that, that we have. It's fundamentally a set of Kubernetes custom resource definitions, CRDs, and controllers that manage GitOps at scale. It's designed up to it's designed to manage up to a million clusters. So this kind of use case, if they have 10,000 5G antennas, absolutely no problem. We can push the workload there at, at scale and at speed. Uh, you may have heard of other CD approaches. Something that differentiates Fleet is rather than being a push-based uh, CD approach, Fleet is a pull-based approach. So each worker node will be pulling from the Fleet server in the top end of the cluster, and then Fleet will be pulling from GitHub or GitLab or whichever your, uh, whatever tool of choice you're using for storing your YAML or your Helm manifests. And yeah, it works pretty well over unreliable networks, so it handles temporary failures quite well as well. So quick overview of the processes running on each node type. So your master node will always have your API server, etcd, with the caveat that K3S can run SQL Lite, but most of the time it's etcd. Uh, Cube scheduler and the control and man manager. And then your worker nodes have the free core processes there. It is worth noting on some distributions, you may not realize that your master node is also running those bottom free processes anyway. Uh, RK, for example, runs the kubelet and the kube proxy in a container itself. So they usually they can be there running in the, uh, in the background. So uh, there's a bit missing on there. Ah, animations, nice. <laughs> so understanding the resource consumption was key to these two customers. So this uh, table here is the resource consumption analysis for uh, K3S distribution, which is a lightweight Kubernetes distribution. It's got all of the binaries stripped down. It's nice and compressed. I think it's how big is it? 60 meg? Roughly 50, 60 meg, you can provision it in seconds. So you can see on the chart there that there's not really much difference between an agent running on its own and an agent running with a cluster. So rather than 5% of a core, you can have 10% of a core and it's still within half a gig of memory. Obviously, if you were running K3S with a master node and then had a thousand worker nodes, that resource usage may be higher, you have ETCD, IOPS, and all that kind of stuff. But in a remote location where you're only likely to have one worker node, this is a, a pretty good uh, chart to go on. And there's some extra discussion here found on this, uh, this GitHub link in terms of uh, resource usage. <clears throat> I'm going to hand over to Juan now, who will talk about some of the challenges in more technical detail that we had for these uh, customers. <clears throat> OK, thanks for that. Well, now let's start uh, discussing the uh, the challenges we, we faced with uh, this approach that were said for us it was not the best practice, so, but we tried to accommodate to what the customer was requesting. But uh, again, Kubernetes is designed to have constant connection to the, to the worker node, or at least semi-constant. So it was not uh, performing really well. It can be doing strange things if that co uh, connection is uh, not permanent. Okay. 
So uh, at the end of the day, when we are working in such a scenario, the problem we have is we want to set up something reliable and, and the yeah. use cases that we were describing at the beginning, obviously we want our five, the software and the 5G towers to work perfectly, we want the security camera to work okay. The problem with that is we need to do more testing because we are more influenced and more impacted about the physical uh, layout of the network we are running up. Also, it's something that is really straightforward and everybody understands here because we are working on this, how we deploy software. But these guys want to really manage, for example, the guys managing 5G, they really want to use uh, the worker node and the antennas as if it were a virtual machine. And they want that mindset, they have mind, the mindset when they deploy. So that means that a software goes to an antenna, okay, and, and another antenna will have a different software or the same one, but the placement should be exactly one-to-one. -one. That means they have to do deployments that have no selector, they target individual antennas. And that's a challenge because you, you may imagine you want to target a software deployment to 1,000 antennas, you have to create 1,000 deployments. That's a mess, okay? So, and obviously, uh, we have challenges with uh, traffic Kubernetes runs on top of an overlay network, okay? And if we want antennas to behave as they were an isolated world, okay? We need to be careful that the traffic is local, okay? Because we are in a 5G uh, use case, so if the traffic jams for any reason, okay, and goes through nodes that are remote, we can add increases latency. Later, we will see that the surveillance camera use case is a little bit uh, easier, but the challenging one is related to uh, 5G antennas. So in terms of software deployments, uh, we will see uh, some of the challenges, but uh, the only perfect way to control that a worker node and a specific worker node have a, uh, 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 the deployment we want is to use a static pods. But again, that's an anti-pattern. That's not uh, something that is recommended. So uh, we have other type of deployments. Uh, but we mix here two things. One is the availability, okay? If we want uh, a node that is running uh, on an antenna to be able to survive any kind of situation, the only, th the only type of deployment that is matching that is the static pod definition because it's the same model that Kubernetes uses for its own process. So an, a static pod is able to start even if there's no connection to the control plane. And that's not the case for the rest of or the type of deployment, or there are some difference. So we have the challenges of uh, targeting our deployment to a specific places or a specific location and make them resilient, okay? In this situation we're describing, bad network links, uh, partial connection, and that kind of situation. Then, uh, as I said, we have the reboot problem, okay? At to some point, we can manage when we deploy, uh, we made a deployment and the pod is running a remote location. It will keep running on most of the scenarios if we configure properly things like uh, times and tolerations. Okay, we can tolerate uh, things like unready or not ready status on the nodes, so the workload will keep running, uh, even if there is no permanent connection to the control plane. And now for our 5G uh, towers, that's okay. But what happens if during the disconnection, then the antenna is reboot for some reason. Then the processes will not start, okay? And that's a challenge and probably the, the biggest uh, limitation of this model, and this is still on the work with, with the team. So let's go into more details to the scenario we're, we're describing. So from a working point of view, we need to achieve that model, the blue model, okay? Because each antenna, each location is completely independent to the others, okay? So the uh, traffic should be all north-south on that location, and the only east side, east west traffic that is allowed is the control uh, traffic just to uh, update the status of the nodes and just do the deployments. In terms of the user workloads, we should not avoid in any case that kind of red traffic, okay? so. Uh, a mobile device that is connected to an antenna should be always, the traffic should be local. If we jump, we are dead in terms of telco. It's completely unacceptable the amount of latency that we may be adding by that kind of scenario. So uh, with discussing with the team, uh, we were facing this, this, this problem. And again, we, we, to be able to solve this somehow, we don't have a lot of options because from a, a Kubernetes point of view, okay, the way we expose services, 
for example, the typical way to expose them, like node port or cluster IPs. When we do that, uh, those type of definitions are cluster-wide. Okay, that means if each single application running in one of the antennas needs its dedicated node port, we may end up with hundreds of thousands of node port definition that even if we manage to make the traffic local, the definition itself, the custom resource will exist in the central location. So our HCD database will become huge over time. So, and that's, that's a big problem. So one solution to overcome that was going back to host port. Host port, again, is an anti-pattern. Nobody's using uh, nowadays host port, except for some specific workloads. For example, sometimes the English controllers are using host port, uh, but it's not uh, recommended or, or it's not used. But when we started to discuss in this, it was the only possibility because that way you decide that a, a port that is running on a node is consuming a specific port. And that go to in the deployment definition. You need, don't need to create services, ingress, or any other way, or any other uh, definition to explore the service. Okay, so that's where it's over there. So we started to discuss with them this basic approach. At the end of the day, within uh, allocation, our application will be uh, using uh, host port, and the local load balancer on each location will cover, take care of the traffic, and that will make the, the traffic to uh, become local. This uh, may work, but has a problem is that uh, even in this model, we are using the uh, Kubernetes overlay network. So for telco uh, use cases, add some latency. We also discussed some other uh, alternatives that are a little bit complex, trying to keep the def deployment definition simple, okay, and not having to hard code the host port. We try to offload that to a local ingress. But again, we need to rely on cluster IP services that will be visible across the cluster, and it will really create a lot of burden later on in terms of maintenance. Solution, as happens in many uh, telco use cases, OK, go back again. Manage our Kubernetes workloads as if they were virtual machine. So these guys have the antennas connected to a local VLAN, a physical network. Let's use. <laughs> Multus plus IOB connected to the local LAN. End of the problem. Like again, an anti-pattern. Okay, so as you can see, uh, the customer is really interested on using Kubernetes for this, and we get some value. But uh, we are really using all the possible anti-patterns that we may think of when we do deployments. Okay, and that's just uh, in terms of uh, let's say networking. Okay. So in terms of configurations, uh, obviously, we need to tweak things a little bit. We have cluster-wide configuration, node-wide configuration, and also the configuration we do at the workloads. These are the most relevant cluster-wide configurations for that type of scenario. Okay? The first one, in our case, as we, we, we have kubelet also master and workers, is the, uh, the status update frequency, how often the, the node is going to tell the control plane that it's alive. And the other two are related, again, to timeouts and, uh, and checks that are done by the QB API. QB API is the one listeners need for the nodes to make call to the API. And the Cube controller basically is our controller that is checking and uh, managing the desired state, desired state within the cluster. So. We don't want to change that. This, when you change this in a cluster, unexpected things happen, okay? Because the defaults are pretty well tweaked, okay? And you don't want to change a lot. So safe bet is just double the values, okay? They are not huge, but have in mind that we are increasing the time it will take us to realize about real failures. And that will be increasing a lot. If in a normal situation, it takes like five minutes to, to identify that a node is down. Here we are doubling or tripling because of all the timeouts and the retries, that amount of time. And that's not really good. What we found, okay, that during the test was worked better, okay, is even go back to the standard values or increase them as much as double. Okay. They try tend to think that uh, we should increase them, those values, but they say no, wait. So the best way to control that is uh, using tolerations because then, okay, you keep, uh, let's say, your cluster in a safe uh, configuration and you uh, control the situation more at the workload uh, level. So you can uh, later on tweak at the workload. So you can 
use some parameters for one workload and some different parameters for another one. Okay, so these are the three states that may happen in a node when it lost connection to the control plate. So we need to add those toleration to all the deployments we do in the cluster. Recommendation: If you can use toleration seconds, so we are going to tolerate this status, yes, but not indefinitely. Okay, again to try to uh, make things more robust. Traditionally, uh, deployments like Demon Set already include those values, but here we need to add those toleration to a standard deployment. Okay, and in terms of application, it's uh, what we describing. Okay, we are using Kubernetes. We create a deployment. We say replica three. Oh, sorry, replica three. Okay, that's not going to work here because our antennas, our worker nodes, were are all different. Okay. So it's time we do deployment, we should target individual antennas. So we are forced to label all the worker nodes in the antennas with unique IDs and do a single deployment for each antenna. 1,000 antenna, 1,000 deployment. That's a scalable, usable? No. Okay, but uh, fortunately, this, the telco guys usually try to uh, work with uh, an orchestrator called ONAP that was doing this for virtual machines. So they have repurposed that automation doing by the own app orchestrator to, instead of deploying to 1,000 virtual machines, do 1,000 uh, Kubernetes deployment using node selectors so they go straight to the antenna they want to, to go. Okay, so any question about the telco before we switch to the security camera? One question over there. <laughs> yeah. So given that you don't use services, but in the, one of the earlier slides you showed using Q proxy in every node, why do you have Q proxy if you don't need services? No, uh, in that slide we we're talking about in general and consumption, because we told the customer, why don't you run full clusters? Because we want to optimize resources. And we said, you are not wasting those much, that much resources. When you're working with K3S, it's not that much, and you get a lot of benefits because everything is cleaner. Okay, and we are offering you a solution that is called Fleet that is able to do the CD, the continuous delivery to thousands of nodes. Why go into this model and make it overly complicated? And it's, as I say, it's a virtual machine mindset. Okay. Uh, then we have the surveillance camera uh, use case, and this is also quite typical nowadays on this deployment. It's quite similar. What we have here, I need to go fast, basically is each camera is a worker node, okay? And here it's true that they use ARM64 ARM compatible hardware and the resource are really limited here. And there is, in this model, they also want to apply artificial intelligence. So what they are doing here are smart cameras. Those smart cameras are going to be capturing information, but also will receive the, the result from uh, AI training models. So they will apply things like mass face detection that we were seeing in your session and that kind of stuff. So they need to be smart devices. But, uh, and they have been starting using place location relatively small, like building and stadiums right now, but they want to extend do this to public transportation. When we are in the same building or we are in a stadium, we are in a local network. Okay, so we expect the latency to be low. Even some of the cameras are using Wi-Fi and having in mind that the same connection that is used for all the control signaling is also used to the image itself. But that really behaves more or less like a real cluster. So in this case, it's not that strange to follow this model. Okay, but again, and there are some challenges that are shared in both scenarios, especially when we move and scale the environment. In this example, we recommend that the customer keep the default values. Okay, don't change anything. And the most important deployment that will be the software that will live in the cameras will be deployed as a demon set. So again, they are the same toleration, but these ones will be already bundled uh, within the demon set deployment. So nothing really fancy. So in this case, uh, it was not that hard to be uh, to achieve the, the result they wanted. In terms of application deployment, Okay, what will go to the cameras will be a daemon set, a node selector, okay, for type camera. Then we have, they will have the local uh, artificial intelligence manager that will be at the facility, that will be also targeted by a node selector, the rancher management itself. 
And then we have the nodes that will be doing the training to, for the uh, artificial intelligence model, okay? And that those will be targets. So here, the deployments are more like a typical deployment as the type of nodes we have is not that big, okay? And that's basically all. All questions? Thank you.